Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm your instructor, Jim Pytel, and today's topic of discussion is complex numbers using rectangular format. Our objective is to introduce complex numbers using rectangular format and learn to mathematically manipulate complex numbers using rectangular format. This lecture is predicated in the assumption the viewers watch the sine waves, amplitude and effective values, period and frequency, and phase shift lectures, all available at the Big Bad Tech channel. If you haven't watched these lectures yet or only didn't recall their contents, please take the time to do so now. This lecture presumes the viewer has more than a passing familiarity with time-variant sinusoidal phenomenon. If you've been following this lecture series in its intended sequence, you are no doubt full of sine waves. Sine waves are meaty, heavy meals stuffed with peak values, peak-to-peak -peak values, effective values, instantaneous values, frequency, period, and phase shift. You are no doubt capable of evaluating sinusoidal phenomenon on an instantaneous basis and have an understanding and appreciation for the copious amount of both time and effort it takes to drag this ponderous mass around with you like a 12-foot pine tree with limbs and roots still attached. Trust that this struggle has not been in vain. This being said, in the course of our instruction, you may have observed some level of repetition and predictability. Ohm's law holds true at all times. And as such, sinusoidal voltage input results in sinusoidal current output for passive components like resistors, inductors, and capacitors. In summary, everything is sine waves. Given this observation, can we not dispense with some of the cumbersome baggage and make use of a far more manageable means of notation, calculation, and manipulation? Indeed, we can. Before I reveal this method, Allow me a moment to express my sincere gratitude to one Charles Proteus Steinmetz for having taught following generations of engineers how to deal with AC phenomenon. Prior to Steinmetz's influence, AC circuit theory and analysis necessitated complicated, time-consuming calculus-based methods. His work with complex numbers, vectors, and phasers, however, made it possible to arrive at the same results using simple algebraic techniques. For this, we thank you, Charles Proteus Steinmetz, and are forever in your debt. This time-saving technique involves the use of complex numbers, which, despite the title, aren't all that complex. Before we examine how this technique is applied to electrical phenomenon, it's worth at least a moment or time to discuss complex numbers on a very general level. These lectures on complex numbers might seem like a detraction from our basic electronics journey, but trust me, they are not a dalliance but rather the core means one uses to perform AC circuit analysis. As such, take these lectures seriously and pause the lecture when asked to do so and attempt the example problems. The more practice you gain with manipulating complex numbers, the less complex they become. Let us begin. For want of an initial example, consider some pedestrian, bike, car, boat, or airplane traveling at a certain velocity in a certain direction. Consider Charles Proteus Steinmetz and his canoe traveling across a still body of water west to east at a velocity of 1.3 meters per second. We can represent this movement as an arrow with a magnitude of 1.3 meters per second pointed west to east. The length of the arrow is proportional to his velocity, in this case 1.3 meters per second, and the direction of the arrow is pointed indicates its direction, in this case west to east. For the time being, we're assuming the body of water he's crossing is totally still and has no influence on his travel. The mathematically rigid among you may be bristling that I'm conflating vectors and complex numbers. I am aware of the differences, but I am purposefully ignoring these subtleties in the interest of forward progress. I am willing to break a couple eggheads to make a phaser omelet. Just go with it for now. Moving on. If Charles was to reach the opposite bank, and then return to his origin at the same speed. We could represent his return as an arrow, also with a magnitude of 1.3 meters per second, only this time pointed east to west. Note since both trips have the same magnitude, they're the same size, only the direction is different. Given he started on one side of the body of water and traveled 1.3 meters per second west to east for a certain amount of time, and then return 1.3 meters per second east to west for the same amount of time, it's quite obvious at the end of the out and back trip, he's back where he started because equal and opposite trips cancel each other out. If we were to concern ourselves with magnitude only, 
Remember, he's going west to east at 1.3 meters per second and east to west at 1.3 meters per second. And neglect direction we get a false picture of what's actually happening. In summary, direction matters. And from this point on, it will continue to do so. Complex numbers in addition to magnitude must include a direction. Continuing with this example, consider Charles Proteus Steinmetz again in his canoe traveling 1.3 meters per second west to east, only this time not across a still body of water, but rather attempting to cross the Mohawk River at flood stage. Let's assume the river is consistently pushing the canoe 0.5 meters per second north to south. Given our coordinate system is oriented such that north is positive and south is negative, we can say that the north to south push has a magnitude of negative 0.5 meters per second. Similarly, given our coordinate system is oriented such that east is positive and west is negative, we can say the canoe's progress west to east has a magnitude of positive 1.3 meters per second. It should be evident that the river's ceaseless contribution of 0.5 meters per second north to south should eventually push this canoe off course. The error manifesting itself as arrival at a point downstream of its intended destination. Charles, however, being a savvy navigator, should be capable of compensating for this disturbance by readjusting his travel direction such that the river's influence is negated and the intended destination is reached without any downstream drift. In this scenario, however, Let's assume no attempt at compensating for the river's flow is made and the canoe reaches the opposite shore just a bit downstream of its intended destination. Note the river's arrow is smaller than the paddler's since its magnitude is smaller and it's obviously pointed in a different direction. The larger point again being that these contributions add up in relation to both their magnitude and their direction. If one action in a certain direction is subjected to some continuous lateral push or pull, the result will be a combination of the effects. This scenario illustrates common behavior for complex numbers and their relatives, vectors, and phasers. Given a complex number in one direction, in this case the canoe west to east, and another one operating a right angle to it, in this case the river's downstream drift north to south, the result is some other complex number with a different magnitude and direction. When you look at this interaction as a case of complex number addition, you will note the result can be viewed as the river arrow's tail relocated to the paddler arrow's head, just as easily as one can view the paddler arrow's tail relocated to the river arrow's head. Complex number addition can be best thought of as two or more independent actions pushing or pulling the result one way or another in their separate directions such that their combined effects add up. In this scenario, a push 1.3 meters per second west to east and 0.5 meters per second north to south result in a travel of roughly 1.4 meters per second at an angle of roughly negative 21 degrees, where positive angles are defined as counterclockwise rotation from the horizontal x-axis, and negative angles are defined as clockwise rotation from the horizontal x-axis. I'll explain how I arrived at this figure in later lectures about conversions between rectangular and polar format, yet another means of formatting complex numbers. The previous scenario illustrated how two actions with a given magnitude and direction can combine into a single phenomenon. However, the opposite is also true. A single phenomenon can also be resolved into two or more independent actions. Consider the act of lifting a heavy couch up a flight of stairs, an action I've had more experience with than I'd care to remember. This expression of force at a specific angle can be resolved into 1. A perfectly positive vertical component acting upwards against the force of gravity, and two, that portion of positive force moving the couch forward left to right. This suggests that a person wishing to get the couch to the top of the stairs has several options at their disposal. Either they could push it at an angle up the stairs, or slide it along the ground left to right, and then lift it straight up, or, just as awkwardly, lift it straight up, then move it horizontally left to right. Either method would result in displacement of the couch to the top of the stairs, albeit the stairs present the most navigable means of doing so. These examples are meant to illustrate that if we restrict ourselves to the descriptive coordinates like north, south, east, and west, or up, down, left, and right, we can use something akin to Cartesian geometry to describe complex numbers known as rectangular format. A complex number expressed in rectangular coordinates necessitates two dimensions x and y. 
where x is defined as horizontal displacement and y is defined as vertical displacement. A pair of x and y coordinates can describe any displacement from the central origin on a two-dimensional plane. Positive x is defined as displacement from the center to the right. Negative x is defined as displacement from the center to the left. Positive y is defined as upwards displacement from the center. And negative y is defined as downwards displacement from the center. It should be evident that positive x and positive y values place us in the first quadrant. Negative x and positive y values place us in the second quadrant. Negative x and negative y values place us in the third quadrant. And finally, positive x and negative y values place us in the fourth quadrant. For reasons of historical inertia, when expressing complex numbers using rectangular coordinates, the horizontal x dimension is customarily referred to as the real dimension, and the vertical y dimension is referred to as imaginary. Imaginary doesn't mean they're fake, like ghosts, elves, and feelings. It's just a term used to differentiate between the two dimensions when expressing complex numbers using rectangular coordinates. Another means of differentiating the two dimensions is that the vertical y imaginary portion is accompanied by an i with an overbar. Use of the letter i is problematic in the field of electrical engineering, since one of the principal electrical phenomena, current, is also symbolized using an i. As such, electrical engineers made the command decision to swap out i for j. Note that j includes an overbar or some other indicator like a bold or a script to differentiate it from a normal numerical entry. Long story short, expressing a complex number using rectangular coordinates necessitates a pair of numbers, the real horizontal x component plus or minus the imaginary vertical y component times j. Note that j includes an overbar and the complex number that we are representing, a in this case, also includes an overbar to differentiate it from a normal numerical entry. Returning to one of our first examples, consider the canoe crossing the river. The canoe's arrow is 1.3 meters per second pointed west to east. It is entirely in the horizontal real plane in the positive direction and can be expressed using rectangular format as 1.3 plus j times zero. Or if you wish to ditch the superfluous multiplication by zero, 1.3. The river's arrow is 0.5 meters per second pointed north to south. It's entirely in the vertical imaginary plane pointed in the negative direction and can be expressed as 0 minus j times 0.5. Or if you wish to ditch the superfluous addition of 0, minus j.5. Thus far, they should be making sense. When performing complex number addition using complex numbers expressed using solely rectangular coordinates, one simply adds or subtracts the real components with only the real components and adds or subtracts the imaginary components with only the imaginary components. Don't make this hard. Real with real, imaginary with imaginary. When we add 1.3 plus j times 0 with 0 minus j times 0.5, we get 1.3 minus j times 0.5. The result is another rectangular complex number with a real component of 1.3 and an imaginary component of negative 0.5, as one might expect. Too easy. Because complex numbers are a little different than normal numerical quantities, they're often written differently. Often textbooks write vectors using a script or bold notation, but I find this technique cumbersome and ugly. I find an easier way to annotate a complex number, vector, or phaser is to simply use an overbar. For example, the canoe's complex number in rectangular format could be represented as a overbar equals 1.3 plus j times 0, or just 1.3. The river's complex number in rectangular format could be represented as b overbar equals 0 minus j.5, or just as negative j.5. And finally, the resultant travel vector a plus b could be represented as c overbar equals 1.3 minus j times 0.5 using rectangular format. As another example of complex numbers and complex number addition using rectangular format, consider complex number a and b. We're being asked to add a and b. Note both arguments include real and imaginary components. 
A has a value of 5 plus J2. This places us positive 5 units horizontally and positive J2 units vertically in the first quadrant. B has a value of 10 plus J3. This places us positive 10 units horizontally and positive J3 units vertically, also in the first quadrant. Note I've been closing each complex number in parentheses when I start this problem. You'll understand the utility of this in a moment. Real with real, imaginary with imaginary. When we add complex number A and B together, we'll displace positive 5 plus positive 10, or positive 15 units horizontally, and positive J2 plus positive J3, or positive J5 units vertically. The result being complex number C, having a value of 15 plus J5. As a practical example of complex number addition, one could consider complex number A being worker A pushing some object with a given force at kind of an east-northeast angle. Along comes worker B assisting worker A with a little bit more force at a slightly different east-northeast angle. The result being displacement of the object in two dimensions proportional to each dimensional contribution. If you think about complex number addition in this fashion, it makes sense that worker A and worker B pushing an object in their own fashion result in a mixture of the effects. Consider a slightly different permutation of this problem, A minus B. This is where parentheses are important. Distributing the negative sign into the parentheses, we arrive at 5 plus J2 minus 10 minus J3. Now all we've got to do is add up the real with the real and the imaginary with the imaginary as previously. We're left with negative 5 minus J times 1. If complex number addition can be likened as A and B acting together, one can think of complex number subtraction as the difference between A and B, where the head of A with respect to B is position negative 5 minus J1 away. Can you dig this on every level that I do? Let's put your understanding of complex numbers and complex number addition and subtraction using rectangular format to the test with these example problems. For most scenarios, I've given you a pair of complex numbers in rectangular format, and I'm asking you to both add and subtract the numbers together. In addition to numerically solving for the result in rectangular format, see if you can depict the arguments and result on the diagram. By all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following values. For our first example problem, A has a value of 2.9 plus J4.1. This places us in the first quadrant. B has a value of negative 5 plus J5.3. This places us in the second quadrant. When we add A and B, keeping the real with the real and the imaginary with the imaginary, we obtain a combined result of negative 2.1 plus J 9.4. If we subtract B from A, we obtain a difference of 7.9 minus J 1.2. The head of A with respect to B appears to be 7.9 minus J 1.2 away. For example, problem two, A has a value of negative 0.5 minus J 3.0. This places us in the third quadrant. B has a value of 6.1 minus J 5.9. This places us in the fourth quadrant. When we add A and B, we obtain a combined result of 5.6 minus J 8.9. If we subtract B from A, we obtain a difference of negative 6.6 plus J 2.9. For example, problem three, A has a value of negative six plus J 9.1. This places us in the second quadrant. B has a value of negative 4.6 minus J 5.4. This places us in the third quadrant. When we add A and B, we obtain a combined result of negative 10.6 plus J 3.7. If we subtract B from A, we obtain a difference of negative 1.4 plus J 14.5. For example, problem four, A has a value of 5.7 plus J 8.1. This places us in the first quadrant. B has a value of 0.9 minus J 4.7. This places us in the fourth quadrant. When we add A and B together, we obtain a combined result of 6.6 plus J 3.4. If we subtract B from A, we obtain a difference of 4.8 plus J 12.8.
for our final problem, we've got three complex numbers, a, b, and c, and we're being asked to add them together. a is a value of 8.2. It's entirely in the real plane and possesses no imaginary components. b has a value of 0.5 plus j 7.0. There's a very, very small real component, but most of it is positive imaginary. c is a value of negative j 7.1. It has no real component, all of which is negative imaginary. When we add A, B, and C together, keeping the real with the real and the imaginary with the imaginary, we obtain a result of 8.7 minus J.1. Note the similarly scaled, yet oppositely pointed, imaginary contributions of each complex number almost cancel each other out, such that the majority of the result is real. When taking into account direction, as well as magnitude, one can expect this to occur more often than you may initially suspect. We'll examine electrical applications of this equal and opposite phenomenon in future lectures on resonance and power factor correction. All right, that's about it for this brief introduction of complex numbers using rectangular format. We'll examine another method of formatting complex numbers, polar format, as well as additional means of manipulating complex numbers like multiplication and division, as well as conversion between the formats and use of the scientific calculator in later lectures. In conclusion, this lecture presented complex numbers using rectangular format, which assigns two coordinates, a real horizontal x component plus or minus an imaginary vertical y component times j. Additionally, we learned to add and subtract complex numbers using rectangular format. Remember to review this material as often as you need to really drive it home. Imagine how well lab will go if you know what you're doing. Thank you very much for your attention and interest, and we'll see you again during the next lecture of our series. Remember to tell your Lazy Lab partner about this resource, and be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech channel for additional resources and updates.